Hello, I'm uh, Karen Taylor. I'm Programme Director of the General Society. And it is our great pleasure to welcome you here this evening to the last of the current series of landmark lectures. Uh, and we're, we're really, uh, and we're, and we're particularly uh, pleased that you can all be here tonight. And I know it's going to be a really wonderful lecture. Uh, the Labour Literature and Landmark Lectures are supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. For those of you who may be less familiar with the General Society, um, just a quick overview. Uh, the Society is 230 years old. You're in our fifth home. We were founded in 1785 by 22 artisans. Today, this 230-year-old organization continues to serve and improve the quality of the people of New York City through our educational and cultural programs. These include our tuition-free Mechanics Institute, the General Society Library, of course, of which you're in this evening, our upstairs Locke Museum, and our nearly 200-year-old lecture series, of which, of course, tonight this lecture is part of. You will also find an informational postcard on the General Society on your seat. And for those of you who might be interested in pursuing library membership, you will find a library brochure on the front registration table. It has been our great pleasure to present this series of landmark lectures in partnership with the New York Landmarks Conservancy. And I would like to express our appreciation for their help and support throughout this series. With regards to tonight's lecture, the Conservancy has been part of efforts to restore and reuse the former DWA terminal at JFK for more than a decade, uh, most recently as a member of the Redevelopment Advisory Committee. This landmark series, entitled Preserving the Recent Past, is curated by Lisa Easton, a partner in the New York-based architecture and historic preservation firm, Easton Architects. As I mentioned, tonight is the conclusion of our landmark lecture series for this season, and I wanted to take this opportunity to thank Lisa for another exceptional selection of speakers and topics. It is now... <laughs> it is now my great pleasure to introduce Lisa Easton to you, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us on our final lecture in our landmark series. Before I introduce our final speaker, I'd like to share quickly a bit about our program and this season of landmark lectures that brought together a fantastic collection of speakers whose topics focused on a few of the most precious New York City landmarks of the modern movement. The General Society established a series of free lectures, as Karen mentioned, in 1833, as provided for in its charter, which was the first of its kind in New York City. The series, Labor, Literature, and Landmarks, presents aspects of work and social and cultural history unique to New York City. The goals are to stimulate intellectual exploration, foster aesthetic appreciation, and encourage public awareness of landmark environments, work, and culture specific to New York City. Our landmark series focuses on the origins, development, and restoration of New York's built environment and celebrates the art and architecture which is central to the city's identity and pride throughout history. Our focus this year has been on landmarks of the modern movement, which presented some of New York City's and the world's most significant landmark structures that have an intrinsic link to the five boroughs, its people, the culture of the city, and the history of modern architecture. So to recap, our first presenter was Michael Silva, director and presenter of the documentary film, Modern Ruin, A World's Fair Pavilion, and held the premiere screening in this room of the film about saving Corona Park's World's Fair Pavilion. Nancy Hudson presented the restoration of Frank Lloyd Wright's Guggenheim Museum, perhaps our city's greatest icon of museum architecture of the modern movement. 
Glenn Bornasian spoke about the conservation of the Guggenheim, tonight's Saarinen's TWA terminal at JFK, and the United Nations headquarters. And tonight, our final speaker, Richard Southwick, will present his thoughts on the planning and preservation of the TWA terminal. It is without a doubt this series has provided the objective we set out to accomplish, to raise awareness of the artistic and cultural history and to generate intellectual exploration of what makes our city and our role in preserving and advancing it so significant. Tonight, I'm honored to introduce Richard Southwick, partner and director of historic preservation at Bayer Blender Bell Architects and Planners, who will be presenting the life, death, and rebirth of the TWA Flight Center. A specialist in preservation, Richard has guided the revitalization of many of New York's most celebrated historic buildings and sites, as well as international sites of cultural significance. Much of his work involves civic and institutional projects that provide lasting and meaningful public benefit, including the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum, the United States Courts, Lincoln Center for Performing Arts, the Morgan Library and Museum, New York City Hall, the U.S. Capitol, I had to cut the list a little short, so these are just the top ones, <laughs> Manhattan School of Music, and the Red Star Line Museum in Antwerp, Belgium. Richard, a self-proclaimed modernist at heart, has developed a particular expertise in restoring modern landmarks at New York City's metropolitan airports, including the TWA and the Marine Air Terminal and the Seminole Art Modern Administration Building at Newark Airport. Tonight, Richard will focus on Aero Saarinen's TWA terminal, which opened in 1962, designed as the centerpiece of JFK International Airport. He will explore the design process undertaken for the building and its critical acclaim, signifying it as a modern icon, and share the building's history from the jet age through rapid advances in the aviation industry, ultimately rendering the building outmoded and obsolete. Richard will share the building's history, legacy, and fate in the wake of preservation efforts to save, restore, and reuse the iconic structure. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you Richard Southwick. Well, thank you, Lisa. And first of all, thank you, everyone, for showing up. Um, tonight's interesting night, uh, Landmarks Conservancy is doing a tour at um, the Ford Foundation. Um, and I have two favorite buildings in New York City. Uh, and when I came to graduate school for architecture in the 1970s, I came to visit TWA and the Ford Foundation, uh, which happens to be the successor firm of Saarinen. So there's a, a real connection between the two. Um, uh, second opening statement I want to say is that um, I think the statement of the death of TWA is a bit premature. Um, uh, TWA is not dead though it has been in a coma for 15 years. It's been vacant since uh, 2002, a long time ago. And the story I want to talk about tonight is uh, the story of its evolution. Please <laughs> <laughs> mute that for me if you can. <laughs> and I do have clients. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, TWA, TWA uh, Flight Center is uh, probably the most celebrated modernist icon of the post-war era. Uh, it's really a symbol of uh, the new jet age, a symbol of post-war optimism, and of structural ingenuity. Um, I want to start with a quote from Ada Louise Huxtable, the uh, uh, architectural critic of the New York Times at the time this was built, who said that, um, Although this was the most dubious idea of all the new architecture at uh, JFK Airport, Idlewild at the time, paradoxically, it turned out to be the best uh, executed piece of work. And um, uh, there was a great deal of publicity when it, uh, before it opened, and it's been very well received by the public. Um, the building is very expressive uh, and very sculptural, both on the exterior and on the interior. Um, there's a very... Uh, elegant palette of tile, plaster, and carpet, uh, carpet and a very beautiful uh, uh, expressive form work both on the outside and the uh, inside of the building. Uh, this is one of my favorite photographs. Um, Ezra Stoller in the uh, uh, 1962 published a, a monograph. Um, you'll see a number of his photographs uh, throughout the course of this lecture. Um, but this shows the uh, uh, connection between uh, aviation, um, uh, movement of people, movement of uh, uh, planes, and the building itself. 
Uh, Eero Saarinen um, uh, was a very celebrated architect uh, early in his career. Um, the building opened in 1962, and unfortunately he died at a very early age of 51 in 1961, so we never did see the opening. Um, he had a very impressive uh, legacy even at that early age. Um, he's the architect of the St. Louis Arch, uh, Bell Labs, uh, CBS headquarters, uh, the Dulles Airport, plus uh, many other projects uh, uh, that he was able to accomplish in a very uh, short career. Uh, he really changed the way that Americans looked at, um, at architecture. Um, he be he uh, uh, turned this into a populist um, expression and uh, was in fact on the cover of Time magazine at the age of 44 in 1956. Uh, so what I want to talk about today is uh, the restoration that's taken place. Uh, the first phase of it was completed uh, about four years ago, and we're poised and ready to start the next phase of restoration and the adaptive reuse. But before I do that, I want to uh, put TWA into a historic context. Um, uh, in 1938, LaGuardia Airport opened, um, but New York City very quickly realized that uh, with the growing aviation industry, uh, LaGuardia is way too small. And they uh, acquired a large tract of land in Queens. It was the Idlewild Golf Course and some industrial tracks, and they started to plan a new airport. Uh, Delano Aldridge, who had uh, designed the Marine Air Terminal and the rest of LaGuardia Airport, um, was engaged to do this work. Uh, and they looked at a lot of prototypes, um, pinwheels, horseshoes, figure eights, um, and uh, they all turned out to be uh, much too expensive. Um, so uh, the New York uh, Airport Authority came up with a different idea. Uh, they decided to um, uh, lease out the land for each of the airline terminals to uh, each of the uh, each of the airlines, and they provided the infrastructure, the uh, uh, the, the uh, roadways, the oops, the roadways, the taxiways, and the uh, uh, the runways. Uh, but each of the uh, airlines provided their own terminal. Uh, this did two things: it allowed the airlines to really express themselves uh, with their own identity, and probably most important for New York City, it transferred the cost of building all the terminals to the airlines rather than to the city. So uh, what you see here is a, uh, uh, the final master plan that was um, developed. Um, and it, it's really called Terminal City. There are a series of, let's see, uh, a, a series of individual um, terminals uh, really focused around the large international terminal, or Terminal 4 now. Um, and the TWA uh, really had the most uh, significant site. Um, this is the entry road. It was right across the reflecting pools, uh, and it was in a very prominent location at the end of that axis. Um, interestingly, uh, on the opposite side, uh, their main rival at the time, which was Pan Am, uh, had the other uh, flanking location uh, next to the International Terminal. Um, Huxtable at the time uh, said when Pan Am was d designed that it was probably the best idea and probably the worst execution. So um, it was very interesting that um, uh, it did not fare very well in the, uh, the popular press. So anyway, the uh, uh, airport opened in uh, 1948. Um, taxiways, runways were all installed, uh, and the terminals followed. Uh, so it was really a series of Quonset huts. Uh, by the late 50s, the uh, airport was really taking shape. Uh, this is a large international terminal. You see uh, just exquisite um, uh, site work, reflecting pools. There are a couple chapels in the uh, center. This is all consumed by parking garages now and a spaghetti of roadways. Um, but what's really interesting too is you see TWA uh, really uh, falling behind. They really, it took a long time to get that uh, designed and built. So there are Quonset huts, but they were in operation. You see the, uh, the old prop planes that were in uh, operation at the time, the old constellations. Uh, but finally, uh, uh, the, the uh, TWA, TWA flight center was completed, as well as the uh, whole terminal city. Uh, this is a plan of the airport in around 1970, uh, which shows uh, the flight center with the two uh, 
uh, tubes and flight wings uh, completed. So what you really had here is a whole series of very unique uh, uh, sculptural structures, each uh, expressing the corporate identity of uh, each of the airlines. Uh, let's fast forward about uh, 20 years. Uh, the aviation industry uh, expanded exponentially. The uh, uh, passenger counts, the uh, types of planes, all uh, progressed uh, extremely quickly during the, uh, the latter part of the 20th century. Uh, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, which had taken over the, uh, um, the three major airports in the uh, New York area, had decided that uh, all of the old terminals were obsolete and they needed to uh, uh, come down and there, there needed to be new construction around the central core. Um, uh, after much discussion um, in the mid-90s, uh, TWA was to be demolished after much discussion and uh, input from the preservation community. Uh, it was determined to save this one uh, historic terminal, the last survivor of the terminal city. Um, this was an extremely important site. Uh, the red lines show the disparity between the small land side uh, frontage and the very large air side or tarmac. So um, uh, a terminal uh, at this location could support many, many more gates than what uh, TWA uh, provided. So um, a compromise was actually uh, uh, worked out to keep TWA uh, basically decommission it as an airline, airline terminal and build a new uh, large terminal behind it. Uh, the plan at the time had United Airlines, JetBlue, and a consortium of smaller airlines all moving into the site. So anyway, I want to go back again to uh, the 1950s, uh, the development of uh, uh, the TWA Flight Center itself. Uh, Saarinen at the time was really the, uh, the darling of corporate America. He was doing uh, a series of uh, buildings for large corporations, IBM, CBS, uh, General Motors, um, uh, John Deere, and these are all very distinctive symbols and all very different uh, uh, pieces of architecture that uh, expressed the identity of each of the corporations. Um, he was hired by Howard Hughes in uh, 1956 um, to design the flight center. Um, his office was a little bit different than a lot of other offices. They worked in large-scale models, and um, uh, they would do uh, very large shells, very large models, and get within and take photographs, and that was the way they really conveyed a lot of their design work uh, to their clients. Uh, I'm not sure if this is, in fact, Saarinen. We've never identified the shoes, but um, uh, we do know that um, uh, these were uh, person size models. Um, I do want to point out uh, the shells. Uh, there were many, many iterations of what uh, this building ultimately turned out to be. Uh, these are a few early uh, sketches. Um, and what was interesting in the uh, uh, three-year development of the concepts, uh, the very basic concept never changed. Uh, Saarinen had done uh, a lot of uh, firsthand research of how one walks through an airport, how long it takes to get from the car to the, uh, the check-in and to the plane, and um, uh, put those, um, those theories into his idea for the, uh, 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 for the terminal. And each terminal uh, design had a, um, a head house, you know, the reception ticketing area, tubes that would connect the head house to the uh, flight wings, which is where you actually boarded the plane. Uh, these are two early schemes. Uh, one of the intermediate schemes I think is very interesting. It uh, had two large glass enclosed tubes with, uh, uh, people, uh, with uh, people movers or um, uh, curved, following the, the uh, curve of the roadway, uh, um, glass tubes that would get people out to the planes. Uh, ultimately, uh, the the shell and the terminal took uh, the uh, terminal design uh, uh, took form. Um, though, uh, as the structure of this work was being uh, um, developed, uh, there was a, a real flaw that was identified. Most of those early shell designs you saw on the wall uh, were one large piece of concrete. This is approximately 350 feet long. Uh, there were no control joints at all. So. Um, Working with the uh, structural engineer, um, 
which is Ammon and Whitney and Abattoir from Ammon and Whitney, uh, uh, it was decided to sever the building into four lobes, and that's uh, uh, the location of the new skylights. Uh, the, uh, the use of um, thin shell concrete was really uh, very experimental in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, Saarinen had employed this at the uh, Kresge Auditorium at M MIT. Uh, if you know the George Washington uh, Bridge bus terminal uh, up here, uh, Luigi Nervi did a beautiful folded, uh, uh, folded plate uh, terminal. Um, probably the most uh, famous is uh, John Utzon's Sydney Opera House in, in Australia. So this was all being produced at the, at the same time. The, uh, uh, the shell itself was anywhere from eight inches thick at the thinnest uh, uh, locations to uh, about two and a half feet thick, um, all highly reinforced. So anyway, so uh, uh, the shell was uh, divided into four lobes. Uh, skylights were put into these locations. And it, this is one of my favorite photographs. Um, it's a photograph of uh, the concrete pours nonstop, took uh, place over uh, 72 hours. Um, but what's really interesting, you see two things, just the th very heavy network of reinforcing steel. And also, this is a symbol of how this building was on the cusp of the jet age. Um, you see the super constellation prop planes on one side and the uh, newly introduced Boeing 707 on the opposite. So uh, um, these last three slides were up um, courtesy of Abattoir, who's the original structural engineer. He's uh, in his mid-90s. We've had the opportunity to interview him a few times over the last uh, uh, five or six years, and um, uh, he's just a wealth of information. So uh, we've been able to interview a number of the uh, uh, designers and participants in the original design. Um, a word or two more about the, the concrete shell. Um, the four lobes or four uh, parts of the building all come together in the very center. Um, I use the analogy of a bird which has uh, a lot of weight and two very spindly uh, legs. And uh, half the weight is uh, balanced fore and half the weight is balanced aft. And they're on uh, uh, two very uh, slender columns. This entire building only has four columns, although each of the columns is about the size of a small house. But um, uh, it's in perfect balance, at least theoretically, and each of these very, very large pieces of concrete is supported at just two corners in perfect balance. Um, the uh, building also celebrates the, uh, uh, the expressive nature of concrete. You see a lot of the board formwork uh, that was purposely kept uh, very rough to show that it was a plastic material and was uh, uh, formed and um, uh, made of a, 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 a mo more modern material. Um, and this photograph is particularly uh, telling because none of the uh, uh, current wall, none of the uh, infill was put in yet. So anyway, uh, uh, by the end of construction, um, uh, this is a shot of the building uh, from the or early 1960s, and this is uh, uh, how it looked in its executed form. So anyway, as the uh, aviation industry continued to grow, um, so did uh, TWA. This uh, terminal um, had a number of expansions. Uh, in This is the original blue, which is the original head house, and the first tube, which was built uh, in 62, uh, led out to a series of small uh, lounges uh, called trumpets. Each of those sat uh, 100 people, which is about the size of uh, seating capacity of a, a Boeing 707. Um, uh, within seven years, uh, the second flight tube was built, 1967. And uh, you can see it's a much larger scale. The uh, Boeing 747 was introduced uh, in the latter part of that decade. And uh, even at that point, it turned out to be uh, really undersized. Um, uh, additional baggage wings were put on either side. Uh, a lot more uh, ticket counters were put into the building. A large building was uh, annexed on the back side of the uh, south side. And uh, uh, the, the building turned out not to be very uh, adaptable for expansion. Um, remember that uh, Saarinen designed the Dulles Airport at the same time. Uh, that opened in the early 60s. And uh, that was a long building that could be extruded and was, in fact, um, uh, expanded about seven or eight years ago. Uh, there have been plans to expand this over the years. And what you see here is our very unsuccessful uh, uh, attempts to do so. So 
So the building was essentially obsolete within 10 years. By 1970, um, the, uh, the, the uh, numbers of passengers, the types of planes, the uh, services uh, just could not be accommodated in this building. This is a typical shot of uh, uh, just people lining up uh, trying to get to the ticket counters. Uh, another shot, uh, we've all been to the airports, we know the meet, meet and greet. Um, these are the meet and greet folks right next to the, uh, the guardrail in front of the baggage carousel. So um, if you're very unfortunate, one of the uh, people waiting there would grab your bag and walk off. So there were security issues. Um, over time, um, uh, uh, x-ray machines and uh, uh, new security devices all had to be installed and this was a very unadaptable building. Um, on the interior, um, uh, there's a sunken lounge which is facing the air side. That was taken out in the 19, uh, early 1990s and uh, more ticket counters were put in to replace that. Um, there were uh, baggage tunnels that came through the curtain wall. The, the building did not age well because it was not very adaptable. Um, in 1978, Jimmy Carter signed the uh, um, the Airline Deregulation Act, and uh, that really uh, revolutionized the uh, aviation industry. And at that point, uh, uh, TWA went in and out of bankruptcy for a, a period of about 20 years. Um, so it was a very, very difficult time for the airline, and they uh, eventually uh, uh, went bankrupt. They, uh, uh, their uh, assets were acquired by American Airlines. The last TWA flight was uh, uh, took off on uh, December 1st, 2001. Uh, American used the uh, terminal for a few months after that and uh, basically um, uh, abandoned the building uh, in early 2002. So the building's been vacant uh, for uh, 15, uh, 14 years now. Uh, Port Authority has um, stabilized the building. The heat's on, the air conditioning's on. They've had a few uh, events there, but um, it's really, uh, 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 really uh, waiting, waiting for its next uh, chapter of redevelopment. So uh, that's what I want to talk about now. Uh, uh, Port Authority realized how important of a site this was, and um, they had been working with uh, United and JetBlue, eventually just JetBlue, to build the building behind uh, the TWA Flight Center. Um, and this is what the site looks like now. Here's the original uh, flight center, the two tubes. Uh, in the redevelopment plan, the two flight wings needed to be removed. So those are demolished. And uh, because this was a federal undertaking with uh, federal monies, uh, this triggered a Section 106 review. And uh, the New York uh, State Historic Preservation Office um, uh, called this an adverse effect and uh, came up with a series of mitigations to um, uh, uh, to compensate for the loss of some of the historic fabric. So, Bayer Blunderbill got involved with the, uh, the building just about that time in the uh, uh, mid 1990s. Um, we were instrumental in, uh, uh, I hope, saving the building from demolition and moving it, um, uh, the air train terminal. Uh, from the front of the building to the flank, um, and then got very involved with working uh, with the chapeau on the uh, uh, Section 106 stipulations. And what came out of that were uh, four or five major issues. One, uh, the building would be nominated to go on the National Register of Historic Places. And this is pretty uh, extraordinary because the uh, age threshold is generally 50 years, and the building was uh, uh, barely 30 years old at the time. And uh, it was an extraordinary quality, so it was an exception to get it listed. Um, uh, HAVS documentation, that's Historic American Building Survey documentation, was undertaken. Um, and uh, drawings and photographs are in the Library of Congress. Um, there is a, uh, a portion of the building that needed to be restored, and that was uh, mandated by the, uh, this agreement. Uh, an interpretive exhibit was developed to tell the story of JFK and, uh, and uh, the TWA terminal. And then a group of um, uh, interested preservationists, um, uh, aviation experts, and even the Finnish consulate, uh, because uh, Saarinen was Finnish, uh, got together and uh, formed the Redevelopment Advisory Committee that uh, oversees a lot of the restoration uh, 
uh, plans. And uh, the committee's still uh, very active. We've had something like 35 meetings over the last 12 years, and we'll continue to be involved with the redevelopment as it moves forward. Um, so there are uh, really two phases of restoration. The first was mandated by the, uh, uh, the MOA, and uh, its major objective was to set the stage for a second phase, which would allow for the adaptive reuse. So for the first phase, uh, we, we needed to improve the life safety, make sure the building was structurally stable, and uh, uh, we took a small portion of the building and did a restoration of that. Uh, like any project that Bayer Blinder Bell works on, we started with very extensive research um, because this building was so renowned. Um, there was a great collection of both popular press and technical uh, information. Um, uh, Saarinen's archives uh, were at Columbia University. They've since been moved up to Yale, and uh, we've been able to go through uh, uh, architectural drawings, specific specifications, even uh, uh, samples of the red carpet. Uh, there's a very good collection. Uh, we had interviews with a number of the uh, participants, uh, Cesar Pelli and Kevin Roach, who uh, uh, have gone on to lead very successful firms, who were both young architects at the time, worked on the project, and were uh, very, uh, um, very generous with their time, talking about the development of the design. And then Abitur, the uh, uh, structural engineer, has also uh, helped us with this. Uh, a great deal of historic photos uh, were available. And out of this, we uh, developed uh, a period of significance, um, which goes from 1962 to 1970. And that's when the full uh, three components of the, uh, the project were completed. And we use that to help inform the uh, restoration design. Uh, these are uh, two samples of the many uh, uh, historic uh, construction documents that Saren's office did. Uh, these are ink on linen. Um, Took a little bit of uh, uh, digging around to really understand these, but uh, they're very helpful in some of the redesign work. Uh, the photographs are actually very important as well. Um, uh, I, I want to credit one of my colleagues, Charlie Kramer, who found one photograph. Um, and uh, one of the keys of photographs trying to date it, oftentimes you look at uh, um, either cars, try to date the automobiles. Uh, this we found a replica of the uh, Michelangelo's Pieta uh, sculpture that was in the center of the, uh, the, the main lobby. Uh, if you recall, the New York World's Fair was in uh, operation 1964 and 1965, and the Italian government had sent the Pieta to the fair, but then sent a replica, uh, which they flew over on TWA, and it was really right in the center of the space back here in this area, and we were able to date the photograph and then identify certain items that were not original in 1962, but were installed during the period of significance. For example, uh, there's a very large uh, speaker array, there's some uh, uh, different uh, 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 color palettes for some of the other uh, work, so we could tell what was original and what was in the first few years uh, compared to what might have been later uh, accretions or additions. So uh, a great deal of photographs were very helpful. So anyway, uh, uh, this phase one restoration started uh, in 2009. Uh, the first thing we wanted to do was to remove a lot of the later era uh, additions. Um, there are seven large vestibules that were added for both uh, environmental control and security. Those were removed. This is a, a shot of that in process. Uh, there's a 1990s bus shelter that was uh, plopped right in front of the building. I think you can see it here. Um, it certainly provided uh, passenger comfort, but it blocked the historic scene. Uh, the very famous uh, photographs of TWA uh, looking at the front of the building would have been blocked uh, with this. So this was taken down very quickly. Um, there was, uh, the building exhibited a great deal of concrete uh, damage, and this was probably our biggest concern. Um, we work with uh, ICR, Glenn Bernasian. Glenn's probably here today, Glenn. Um, uh, Glenn and his team uh, uh, worked with us, and we did a lot of uh, research on the condition of the concrete. And what you can see in this photograph, essentially, is the concrete leaching through a coating that was put on the building in the 1990s. There was a, uh, I really call it a, uh, uh, almost a rubber raincoat. It's elastomeric, non-breathable coating that caused a lot of damage. It uh, captured water that got in, um, and it essentially leached out uh, minerals through the concrete. There's stalactites and stalagmites on the sidewalk. And um, 
uh, we knew we had to remove that. Um, uh, the first phase only looked at the two side wings, not the main shell. So we still had great concerns about uh, the condition of the shell, and we're now finally able to look at that. Um, this is a close-up of what a lot of the uh, concrete looked like. You can see the spools and the bubbling and the uh, deformation of, uh, of the original uh, castings. Uh, there's a whole series of uh, uh, coating removal tests that ICR did. Uh, we ended up using a, a, um, a peel-away product and uh, recoated the building with a, a new Conproco uh, cementitious uh, breathable coating. Um, there's a debate of whether we go back to the original uh, concrete color that was uh, Saarinen's original uh, design intent. The building's been a white building for many years. Uh, it was coated in the 90s, and uh, there's a, a debate going on of whether we uh, want to bring it back to its original color or what people have known for the last 20 years. Um, and we think the uh, uh, concrete color is really the appropriate way to go. Uh, the interior of the building uh, was coated with uh, probably the largest uh, asbestos job I've ever seen. So our very first project was to uh, build a dance floor about eight feet below the entire ceiling and uh, remove the asbestos and put a new uh, acoustic coating on uh, in its stead. And then the, uh, the curtain walls, um, which were very innovative at the time. Uh, Saarinen was playing with uh, a, a, a zipper gasket. Um, uh, he did a lot of work out in the Midwest. Uh, the uh, automobile industry had a, a neoprene gasket that would be the type of gasket on the uh, windshield of your car. Um, this is a very large version of it where the glass gets set in a, uh, into a soft neoprene. Uh, another piece gets uh, put in to add the pressure on the glass and you get the bite. Um, the neoprene's over 50 years old and started to uh, fail. A lot of glass was uh, falling and shattering. You see uh, you know, there were a number of uh, missing pieces with plywood inserts. Uh, you can see the condition of a lot of the neoprene, which was uh, uh, caulked and uh, just uh, repaired over the years. And then in the uh, 1990s, a purple film was over, put over the entire building. So when we started looking at this uh, in the mid-2000s, uh, the building was really quite poor shape. Um, we went back to the same manufacturer for the zipper gaskets. We had extrusions made, and they've replicated the, uh, the original design. Um, and we were able to, in this first phase, uh, repair one of the four facades. Uh, this actually has not been replaced yet, so it's not tempered glass, and uh, uh, this has only been cleaned and the film was taken off. But you can start to see the very uh, complex geometries. and. Um, these all had to be laser, uh, laser measured and cut specifically for these shapes. Uh, the skylights uh, also were very problematic. Um, we have photographs from 1963, one year after the building opened, showing people on the uh, rooftop trying to repair these. Uh, uh, Saarinen used a, uh, uh, the same zipper gasket uh, technology for the skylights, uh, which is perfect for straight uh, window walls, but not for curves. So it never worked, and uh, uh, it was caulked and repaired many, many times over about 50 years. Um, uh, working with Chapeau, we uh, were able to come up with a insulated glass, uh, silicone-sealed um, glazing system that um, is much more appropriate for the curve of the skylights. And um, uh, you can see on the uh, right-hand side the, the replacement, um, and much more uh, uh, sustainable as well. Uh, moving to the inside, uh, probably the most distinctive feature is the sunken seating lounge. Um, uh, this is a rendering that was from uh, Look Magazine well before the building opened. Uh, again, it had such great popular press. And uh, if you think uh, 1960s Mad Men, that's really a, uh, a great uh, symbol of that. But over the years, um, uh, one, it was taken out for new ticket counters. It was, uh, 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 it was repaired, uh, but without the original finishes uh, in about 1995. And, and this is the condition we saw uh, when we uh, started to get involved with the restoration. So um, we went back to the original working drawings. Uh, we looked at um, the original construction uh, poured a new concrete substrate, which uh, all the new benches are uh, uh, supported off of. 
went to a Long Island City uh, uh, furniture manufacturer that uh, specialized in diners, diner banquettes, and he was able to uh, come up with a fairly good replication of what was there. The only difference now is the ashtrays uh, don't exist that were built in, um, but uh, we think it's a, a pretty good replication of um, uh, the original design intent. And here's a, a view of the uh, sunken lounge in its restored uh, condition, taken about three years ago. Uh, probably the most challenging part of the project was the uh, restoration of this, this ubiquitous uh, mosaic tile, or a lot of people call it the penny tile. And uh, uh, a lot of it was uh, in very poor uh, repair. You can see lots of patchwork, missing pieces, um, lots of stains, lots of pop tile throughout. Um, and uh, when we looked very carefully, we noticed that there is not one tile, but there are actually five different shapes. Uh, the typical next to the penny, uh, commonly known as the penny tile, was a uh, half inch diameter, but because there are so many curves and bends to the uh, interior forms, um, there are smaller pieces that were used for infill. And um, uh, we uh, spent about a year trying to source that, uh, found a factory in China, finally to uh, put that, uh, give us our order. Uh, worked with Ann Sachs, who's a, a pretty well-known uh, uh, tile supplier. And uh, it was an interesting story. We had to match ASTM, uh, slip-resistant uh, and acid-resistant uh, requirements. We had to match the tile precisely because oftentimes we're, we're putting one or two tiles within a field of existing tile. And um, we were all set after about nine months of uh, doing this research, finding the right product, and then the, uh, the, uh, the materials never showed up. Um, I saw in the New York Times about three weeks later a small article on an inner page saying, big industrial disaster in China. And it turned out that uh, this whole district uh, had uh, uh, poisoned its water supply and there was uh, uh, a, a great deal of uh, sick children and uh, the whole area was uh, shut down. Of course, our factory was in that district. But um, the company was able to disassemble the factory, move it to a new location and, and be up and running in two months. So we, we uh, had fabricated three and a half million pieces of this small tile and uh, had it on site to do the, uh, do the restoration. Um, before we did that, uh, ICR and uh, 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 Glenn's team did a series of constructability mock-ups, and that's what you see here. Uh, the most difficult tile was the nosing piece. These are all handmade. Um, and we wanted to make sure, particularly as people uh, rolled carts or uh, walked up and down these, uh, uh, the stairs, that um, uh, these tiles stayed in place. Uh, there's an epoxy uh, grout that was used, stainless steel rods, and uh, we did these as part of the design uh, process as mock-ups to put together a series of uh, working drawings, and that's what went into the uh, construction document set. Uh, doing the tile repairs like doing dental surgery. Um, there is a group of uh, five itinerant um, uh, tile craftsmen that would travel around the country. The contractor found this group. Uh, they're actually uh, uh, from Greece, and they worked for the better part of a year doing tile repair throughout the building. And you can see how painstaking it is to route out, clean out, and do some of the replacements. And um, uh, this went on for, for months and months. Uh, this is a view of the uh, restored tile work, and uh, it's important to know that it's not brand new, it's not pristine, nor should it be. Um, uh, this is a 50-year-old building, and it should really show its patina. It should show its age and show its uh, also its uh, craftsmanship. Each of these was placed by hand, and uh, uh, we think we still uh, show that essence or that quality in the restoration. Um, philosophically, that's just an important thing to do, to not turn a building uh, in restoration to uh, look like it's brand new. We, uh, you, you, re you really want to celebrate its legacy and its history. And uh, stepping back about 20 paces, this is uh, uh, what the interior looks like. And you can see that the floors turn into steps, turn into soffits and walls. Uh, the magic of this very small half-inch tile is that you can do the bends and shapes, and uh, you can do the transitions. Um, but one of the problems with this photograph is it's, it's absolutely empty. It's devoid of people. And um, as you know, uh, historic buildings uh, 
no matter how important they are, how restored they are, uh, unless there's some activity, will eventually die. So uh, that gets us to the last chapter, which is where we are right now. Um, uh, the Port Authority knew how important this uh, this building was and this site was. Um, the decision was made to save the building. Um, it, it was not going to be demolished. And they went through a whole series of developer RFPs. The first one, which took place before the, uh, the restoration, uh, went out, they got 60 uh, 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 parties to respond. It turns out that 58 of the 60 were architects. So without any funding, that went nowhere. So the Port Authority then decided we better invest some money in the building to do the restoration. So uh, the phase one restoration followed this um, unsuccessful first RFP. Uh, the second RFP uh, uh, was issued, uh, Andre Balaz, uh, the uh, hotel operator of the Standard and many uh, hotels around the world, um, was a successful bidder on that one. Um, that went on for a couple of years, but unfortunately they were never able to uh, uh, finally execute the uh, financial plan, so they backed out. And a uh, uh, third RFP uh, uh, went out uh, about uh, two years ago. Um, this is what you see now. Uh, only a portion of the building has been restored. Uh, this is one of the cafes up in the mezzanine of the upper level, and large expanses of the building uh, have just not been touched uh, since TWA moved out in uh, 1960, or 19, uh, sorry, 2001. Um, the, uh, uh, the RFP from the Port Authority uh, identified areas that were both restored and areas that needed to be restored in the, uh, uh, the future work. Uh, what you see in green is what I call the historic T, the lower lobby, which is the main entrance off the uh, uh, drop-off area, uh, a series of three uh, very shallow, very gracious steps up to the upper lobby. Here's the sunken seating area. And then the tubes, which went out to the, uh, the old flight wings, which had been demolished for JetBlue. Um, so this historic T is restored. The two flanking areas in yellow, which were the uh, uh, domestic and international ticketing areas, uh, are mandated to be restored. And then up on the mezzanine, the lower plan, uh, was the Ambassador Club, uh, the original uh, First Class Lounge, and then two other restaurants, the Lisbon Lounge and the Paris Cafe. So as you can see, only a small portion has been restored to date. So the third RFP went out a couple years ago, and um, uh, a uh, developer by the name of uh, Tyler Morris from MCR Development, he's a uh, owner of about 100 uh, hotels around the country and uh, operates the Highline Hotel uh, at the General Theological Seminary, um, was a successful bidder. And uh, he's put together a team, and uh, Byer Blinderbell is the architect for that. Uh, we are working with uh, uh, Anne-Marie Lebrano and her group at LCA Architects uh, as design consultants with us and uh, uh, a whole array of other uh, architects and uh, specialists from New York. Uh, the uh, program components um, for this adaptive reuse uh, really uh, it, uh, consists of a large hotel, about 500 rooms, which will be in two new buildings behind uh, TWA, a uh, 40,000 square foot conference center, and a series of uh, bars, lounges, and restaurants. The uh, flight center, head house becomes the lobby for the hotel and um, uh, becomes a, the, the celebrated uh, centerpiece for the project. Uh, we're currently in design development. Um, construction will start later this year and we're looking at an opening uh, in 2019-2020. Uh, so we're about three, three to four years off. So I want to walk you through the plans, and I, I do want to caution that these are still in development. These are still just uh, very uh, conceptual, but I'll uh, walk you through the components of, uh, of the design. Um, here's the flight center. There have been portions of the building that will be taken down, which were not part of the original construction. They're called the bat wings, here and here. And by removing those later era additions, it allows uh, hotel wings to be uh, built between JetBlue and the Flight Center. Uh, what you see in uh, the beige color is the, the lobby. Uh, main entrance coming off of uh, the roadway uh, with uh, a check-in area and ticketing area for the hotel and check-in for the conference center. And on the uh, right-hand side, a food hall. 
Uh, there's also a supper club and a uh, small ballroom on this uh, lobby level. Uh, going up to the uh, mezzanine level, uh, there's a series of restaurants um, up in the mezzanine, uh, the Ambassador's Lounge and the Paris Cafe and the Lisbon uh, Lounge on this side. And here you see the tubes, which had led to the flight centers, uh, now make a connection directly to the hotel wings. Um, each hotel building will have a little bit more than uh, 200 rooms. And then the lower level, uh, which uh, is between the two tubes, and this is all underground, so what you see here would not be visible, um, uh, will be the conference center. There's a 7,000 square foot ballroom, a whole series of smaller breakout rooms or meeting rooms, and a, a pre-function space, and uh, support kitchens and mechanical spaces, again, all uh, below grade. Um, we uh, really deliberated a lot about how you got to the new buildings from the old building. We felt it was very, very important to keep a separation from the new construction and the, and the existing construction. So we looked at Saarinen's original model, where one would come in the main entrance, go up the tubes and out to the planes. And the heart of the entire uh, project was that sunken lounge. Um, using that as inspiration, we've come up with a circulation plan where you come in the front of the building, you work your way up to the uh, tubes on either side, and the core for the hotels are at the end of the hotel wings. And at this point, you either uh, ascend up to the hotel or descend down into the conference center. Uh, the tubes themselves are basically hula hoops. They're uh, uh, lightweight steel uh, hoops uh, with just a cement plaster covering. And uh, we'll make the connection where it comes very close to the hotel. And there'll be a glass, uh, a glass tube, uh, basically very transparent between the historic tube and the new hotel. And uh, that'll be the connection uh, uh, to get uh, to all the uh, new functions, the hotel and the conference center. So uh, this is um, the signature view. This is the, that celebrated view that Stoller always took from the front of, um, uh, front of the flight center. Um, the two hotel wings flanking this are a very simple, plain facade to uh, really act as a neutral uh, backdrop for the, uh, the much more sculptural concrete uh, flight center. And we've looked at that as a uh, contrast in both form and material. And uh, using the concrete frame around the building, but this is a, uh, a grayish glass on either side, and this really stands off from that. Uh, there's an advantage of the uh, very variegated jet blue terminal behind it, and this uh, helps block that out and gives a, a much, much more neutral uh, stage set uh, uh, for this building. Uh, one of the real challenges is uh, building a hotel very close to active runways, and um, uh, the noise level uh, was a, a real challenge. Uh, we've worked at a, a, a current wall design that is a, a, a insulated glass unit, a very large seven inch airspace, and uh, a, a laminated glass uh, uh, unit outboard of that. So it's about a 12 inch overall uh, current wall uh, assembly. Uh, picks up a lot of the uh, original proportions of the flight center, but uh, again, it's an entirely glass facade, both looking back to the flight center or out to the airfield. Um, actually, I want to, uh, the last two slides were from LCA, and uh, we're now um, in negotiations with the uh, current wall uh, fabricators to uh, get this uh, uh, bought out and constructed. Um, back to the inside of the building, uh, uh, we went back to our research books and we started looking at in uh, real detail some of the areas that were not restored in the first phase. And uh, we've gone through uh, most of the important locations of the building. Uh, this is the original first class lounge, the Ambassador Club. And uh, uh, we went both to the original working drawings and also a series of as-built drawings and subsequent design drawings from uh, uh, Saarinen's office and Kevin Roach's office, and we were able to um, look at the evolution of, of these spaces. Uh, we call this a morphology drawing, and uh, what you see is uh, in red the as-built and um, in blue what uh, the original design was. So we've used this to inform uh, 
the prescription of our, our new design. So um, the photo on the bottom is what this looks like now. We've gone back to original photographs, which will help inform the restoration. Uh, you can't read any of this text, but this is out of a uh, um, schematic design report that talks about each of the materials and the, uh, um, the type of treatment we uh, want to uh, use to bring these back to life. You see these wonderful fountains um, uh, that uh, Saarinen designed with plantings and water and their uh, number of water features throughout. Uh, likewise, we did this uh, for the uh, restaurants and the other uh, mezzanine. Uh, this is the condition of the uh, uh, Paris Cafe, going back to the old photographs. It's very helpful uh, and guides us in the restoration. Um, back to the outside of the building, uh, we uh, worked on the construction documents for the curtain wall restoration for the entire building. The funding for the Port Authority only allowed uh, the front of the building, what's in green, to be restored. And uh, we felt that was very important because uh, for any type of even uh, sporadic use, uh, we needed this to be safe to allow people to move in and out of the building. Uh, what's in green, which is about 75% of the uh, current walls, not yet been restored, but will be part of the restoration in this next plan. And uh, using the, uh, the same original specs, uh, Vericon green glass and the zipper gaskets, uh, this will be part of the new plan. Uh, working with uh, ICR and uh, Arab structural engineers, um, uh, as I said, we were very concerned about the uh, condition of the shell. The shell had this uh, um, non-breathable coating. We were very concerned that the concrete uh, would fail, and um, uh, which would probably render the building unusable. Um, we've done a lot of uh, it, uh, structural integrity tests, and. Um, um, it's actually in fairly decent shape because it was built uh, to a much higher compressive strength than what uh, had been designed. Uh, but what you see here are a number of, um, number of uh, uh, test pits and uh, uh, different coating removal tests uh, that ICR has done. And uh, 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 this is a part of the project that we will probably advance uh, fairly quickly to really get a much better understanding of the overall condition of the shell. Uh, finally, the uh, uh, landscape of um, this area is very different in the 1960s. You can see no parking garages, a small number of cars. You could uh, park right in front of the building and walk into the uh, hotel. A very different experience than our typical modern airport experience. But we've used this as an uh, uh, inspiration for some of the very uh, local uh, site development. Uh, we are uh, redirecting traffic, so uh, the drop-off is very close to the terminal. There will be a series of about 40 parking spots in front. And uh, uh, as a hotel rather than an uh, airline terminal, the needs are very different. Um, we want to uh, recreate both the parking area, the landscaping, and the very, uh, uh, very distinctive fountains. Uh, recall that water would uh, pour down this concrete shell and work its way into a receptor. So we're going to celebrate um, a lot of the original design as we do the site work. So anyway, um, that's where we are today. We hope um, within a few years we can all celebrate by having our first drink at the hotel. Um, I'm personally uh, very, very excited that we've gotten to this chapter in, in the building uh, after being vacant for so many years. and. Uh, not being dead, but being in this coma, we uh, are very excited to see its rebirth. So um, thank you for your time. So if you have any questions, I'd be glad to entertain some. Who, own, who owns the building? And uh, I, I, you have the hotel so close that you can't, uh, that there's no air. When you want to take a photograph, the hotel will be in the picture. There will be enough space, the uh, way you showed yeah. us. Okay. Uh, two questions, two answers. Um, the first is that actually more complicated than you think. Um, uh, two answers to two questions. Uh, the first is actually more complicated. Um, uh, 
New York City owns the airport. There's a long-term lease to Port Authority, and then a sublease, if you will, to uh, MCR to develop uh, the hotel. Um, this runs, it's a 75-year lease. The uh, uh, Port Authority's lease runs out before the uh, city lease runs out, so there is a subsequent lease for the last 25 years. So that gets quite complicated, but it's all behind us, fortunately. Um, the buildings are pushed as far back uh, along the curve of the uh, uh, JetBlue uh, roadway as possible. Um, there's been a lot of discussion of uh, how close is close, um, and that's countered, at least in my mind, for how long is long, meaning uh, how long can this building be vacant and what will it be like in another 10 or 15 years? And what is the, um, uh, what is the right uh, development to support the restoration? The uh, Port Authority invested about $20 million to restore what I call that historic T and the asbestos and some of the work on the outside. The overall restoration work, in addition, that's uh, about $65 million. Um, so um, there needs to be, per pro forma, uh, a certain uh, amount of revenue, both through the conference center and the hotels, to pay for this. Um, we think, we hope it's the right time. Uh, we hope that the cycle's, it's not too late in the cycle, um, but um, uh, it's the best opportunity that's come around in about 15 years of looking at proposals that just won't apart. Yes. Uh, I don't, but I'm sure it's a small, small fraction. What's the budget for that hotel? It's $265 million. So it's a significant investment. Yeah, the, uh, the budget, yeah, the, the budget's $265 million. So it's a significant investment uh, of which uh, $65 million will be the uh, additional restoration work on top of the first 20 million that the Port Authority has already invested. So overall about a $300 million project in the, the two phases. Yes, I understand that the compressive strength was higher at the time than was required. Yes. And I was wondering when they did the tests, was there or if there is any reduction in the original design strength, the compressive strength of that concrete core? And if it was, what was the percentage in reduction? And uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is the two uh, hotels on each side, I think is a terrific idea. It emphasizes the wings of this bird-like building. So congratulations to you. Well, and to the full team as well. Um, the structures I find about the most fascinating part, one of the most fascinating parts of this project, um, uh, in our interview with Abitur, uh this structure engineer, um, Theoretically, the entire building is in balance on the four uh, large columns, but in actuality, the two side wings are in tension, and the one of the front wing, the front wings in balance, and the rear wing is in compression. So, there's a uh, large plate of concrete in the very center, which is where the, the clock and the lights are in, in the very center, that uh, uh, is doing an incredible amount of work holding it in and out in compression and tension. Uh, two questions. What is the fate of the of Saarinen's terminal at Dulles Airport? Uh, as a curiosity. Okay, first, uh, yeah, they, uh, it's actually very, uh, very successful. It's been uh, uh, added onto. It opened in 2009. If you recall, it's a flying wing and a, a series of bays, and they've added about 50% to that as the international terminal. So uh, uh, unlike, it, it, Saarinen was experimenting with lots of different prototypes. Again, the, uh, the emergent jet age uh, asked lots of questions. Here, uh, he used one of the first jetways that we're also familiar with in this building. Not the first, but it was one of the first uses of it. Uh, Dulles had the uh, portable mobile lounges. If you've been to uh, Dulles, you get on a, a small bus and it takes you to the plane. It, raises and then you walk off the vehicle onto the plane. So those are done uh, essentially at the same time. And those are two experiments that he had. Um, the other thing is the original scheme, I believe, showed a freestanding 
a canopy, an entrance canopy in front of the terminal. Isn't that, am I not remembering I, that properly? That, that's the original scheme. Okay, I mean, and maybe it was uh, There's a fountain, paper. there's a receptor or a fountain for water here, and it's always been wide open. The, uh, um, Stoller, the, the, the Esto um, monograph has a number of uh, really wonderful photographs looking straight up, um, and it's, it's wide open. <clears throat> okay. Yes, I, I have a few questions. Um, number one, uh, will there be the, a di direct connection from the hotel to JetBlue? Number two, will there be a direct connection to the lobby fr uh, from the air train. Uh, number three, will the power for the hotel and the reception center be from the power uh, on the airport? Uh, three great questions. Let me do them in reverse order. Um, the uh, client sorry, is looking at... I had a fourth one. Oh, fourth. Okay. <laughs> where, Let's see if I can remember will, four at once. Okay. Where, the, where will the guests uh, be provided parking? Will it be one of the PA... Okay parking lots or there are uh, the yellow garage if you know Kennedy uh, uh, the yellow garage which is in the location of this surface parking here is uh, quite ample and uh, there'll be lots of parking there uh, the air train provides really good service as the design team goes out there quite frequently um, uh, the air train terminal the station is off to the left or north you, just off this photograph uh, Interesting, Port Authority wanted to put that station right here, and that was one of our small victories. Um, but you can get off that um, air train station. You can walk through JetBlue and then back the tube to this building. The connection is incredibly important. At one point, oh, another one of our um, spirited discussions was, should we keep the tubes? And I, I felt very strongly that uh, the tubes were a very significant part of the design, the flight center tubes and flight wings. And not only that, the tubes had to connect to JetBlue. You know, at one point, someone wanted to put a glass wall at the end of the tubes. But uh, to, to activate this building, this historic building, you need use. And JetBlue's the, by far the busiest carrier at uh, Kennedy Airport. So you want to be able to have people come from JetBlue and populate this building for its restaurants and uh, other uses. And that was a decision made way before the hotel uh, concept came up. I'm sorry, you had uh, one more question. <laughs> okay, good. Oh yeah, the, 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 uh, we're looking at a uh, cogeneration plant, uh, which will uh, provide uh, through natural gas, uh, their own electricity and uh, chilled water and, and hot water. And that will be uh, uh, amounted in one of the buildings. I, I have the mic. So considering it's not an airline terminal anymore, but it's at JFK International Airport, what are the additional concerns about security that you have by people walking in and by vehicles being so close to that building? Uh, the building is on land side, so it's not a secure zone. So it's very similar to um, uh, any of the hotels that you see that are very close to uh, the terminals. Uh, the new Westin at Denver, for example, the um, uh, Detroit uh, Hotel. Um, uh, we are looking at some security on the JetBlue roadway, uh, but that's more for uh, vehicular safety rather than blast. Um, uh, we have talked to Port Authority ab about this issue, uh, but it's it's uh, very far from the secure uh, portion of the JetBlue terminal, so there will be no real ex uh, extraordinary measures. Can you sorry? Can you speak to uh, the challenge of incorporating life safety and ADA requirements and? without destroying the historic fabric of the building? Uh, yeah, let's stay with um, life safety. Uh, um, the building has no ceiling. Therefore, uh, you really can't put sprinkler lines and sprinkler pipes in. Um, and uh, But what it does have is a great uh, uh, volume. So if there's a fire, 
um, the smoke will rise up into the cavity and uh, uh, there's a, a kind of common test called the mattress test. If you were to light a mattress, how long would it take for the smoke to rise to the top of that large space and then work its way down to uh, nose level, if you will, and you time that and you determine how long it takes to get out of the building. There's a, a great volume there, so um, we, we think uh, that takes care of that. For smoke detect, for a smoke and fire detection, uh, we could not have smoke detectors on the ceiling as well. So there's a series of um, uh, discrete um, uh, photo uh, 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 diodes or emitters with reflectors. And um, if you break the plane of the light, um, the smoke detector will go off. Uh, it's time, because it's such a large space, birds will get into spaces like this. It's time that it has to be interrupted for three seconds or more for the smoke detection to go off up. But if you look really carefully, if you're out there, there are a series of reflectors and small emitters uh, all around the perimeter on the very top of the building. It's hidden into the curtain wall, so it's, it's pretty hard to see. Uh, from ADA, um, in the 1990s, ADA was, uh, that's the Americans with Disabilities Act, was enacted in uh, uh, 1991. In 1994, uh, TWA built a series of wooden ramps right up the main stairs. It was absolutely horrible. And uh, that lasted a couple years. Uh, when we did the first restoration phase, we uh, uh, put a handicap uh, wheelchair lift in a fairly discreet location. Uh, what we're planning now um, are a series of ramps on either side of the main stairs, uh, which allow someone, particularly with rolling luggage, to uh, go up a ramp rather than going up the stairs. And that, uh, uh, that will also um, satisfy the ADA issues. Uh, question here, according to your plans, it looks as if the lower level is gonna be where the conference center is, and I guess that's where the carousels were. Is that correct? And if so, what's going to be the fate of that particular area? Uh, actually, I'll go back historic. and explain because that's, yeah, it's a little bit different. Well, uh, the conference center uh, itself will be underground, um, so that's between the tubes. Um, there is one more ballroom, about a 4,000 square foot ballroom in this location. Um, the baggage, the original baggage carousels were here. Um, actually, another thing that Saarinen designed, these are the first circular carousels with the uh, vomitory, if you will, that the emitter, the, the, <laughs> the luggage would come up and you'd pick it up. So um, uh, that was a very early, uh, one more innovation of this building. But by 1970, uh, that was all ripped out. Uh, those are both too small and in a too valuable, too valuable location. So uh, this large wing built here uh, housed all the baggage uh, carousels. Um, and then the ticket counters, which were only on one side, uh, were expanded, so you had domestic and international. So um, uh, nothing's original. Um, it's, it's been gone for, if my math's right, 45 years. And, and I guess would the ticket counter area now be the check-in for the hotel? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Uh, quite a lot. Um, the new hotel will be called uh, the TWA Flight Center Hotel or the TWA Hotel. Um, the rights to the TWA logo and lettering and even the name um, are in the possession of the developer. He had negotiated with American Airlines for a long period of time. And um, it, it's really going to celebrate both that era and that company. Um, there will be an exhibit, which is part of the uh, Section 106, which will really be the history of TWA as well as the airport. There'll be a small shop that will sell TWA memorabilia. It, yeah, it'll be a, a, um, a real feature of the hotel. Hello, Richard. Thank you so much. It's a beautiful project. And this was actually oh, hi, why Natalie. I decided to you? study architecture. Um, I, can you describe uh, the water harvest, harvesting features uh, from the roof, and also, is this going to be a lead project? Uh, we're looking at lead. Uh, we're targeting gold. Um, it's very premature to say whether we'll get there. Um, 
The biggest um, contributor to that is the cogen plant that we're providing uh, very, very efficiently uh, all the power for the uh, um, uh, for the building. The uh, there's no rainwater harvesting per se, although we are using uh, um, uh, low flow uh, plumbing fixtures and uh, uh, many of the types of um, strategies you'll use for a lead project. Uh, it seems that the structural inspection is still underway, but I was wondering if um, do you have any contingency plans if it turns out that the structure is deteriorated to the point where you have to carve out a lot of the concrete or replace significant amounts of rebar that to a point where it's going to be very noticeable? Uh, yeah, I think that's not going to be the case. I'm pretty sure it's not from our initial uh, results from the second phase of testing. Um, we did that on the wings. Uh, it turns out the wings were in much worse shape and uh, we, uh, there was a lot of exposed rebar. Uh, the rebar had to be repaired, recoded, and uh, uh, there was uh, remedial concrete that was placed over it. Um, uh, we've found much uh, higher quality, uh, uh, higher compressive strength in the shell. Um, uh, Glenn Brunese and his team did a lot of non-destructive testing. Uh, there was moisture uh, uh, within the shell. There's uh, uh, rebar that's close to the surface. But some of the steel that we, found, we saw was, in fact, um, part of the uh, original installation. Uh, there were uh, spacers to be able to pour the exact contour that were uh, placed um, with the formwork. And uh, what we thought might have been uh, uh, exposed rebar were, in fact, uh, part of the device to pour the concrete shell. So uh, we're uh, fortunate that it's in much better shape than we, we thought it could have been. The height of the new hotel wings uh, seems to be very close to that of the building, such that the roof line kind of uh, competes with the, with the, 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 the shell that's, that's so striking, you know, the bird-like form. Did they consider going higher or maybe building something that would also be in the same biomorphic style that would kind of make it into a, a whole complex the, the, uh, sharing the same aesthetic? Uh, no, we did not consider going higher, first of all. Uh, there are actually FAA requirements uh, for sight lines from the uh, control tower to the runways and taxiways. Um, two, we think that the height is probably appropriate uh, if you take your sight lines from in front. Um, uh, it, it provides a very uh, elegant background, but a very uh, consistent, coherent background to the, the building. And we, uh, I personally really like the contrast of the uh, uh, much more expressive concrete form and the uh, much more contemporary but um, uh, and very elegant glass form behind it. Um, it's of a height where it really blocks the jet blue behind it as well. I mean, the irony is the main view of jet blue, uh, which blocked uh, years ago blocked the uh, view of the, the runways themselves uh, is still visible because we felt it was uh, uh, very uh, sacrosanct to try to put anything between the tubes. So all of the uh, new development had to be outboard of the tubes to preserve the view out of the main uh, lobby and the sunken seating area. We are going to close the formal part of this program, but I'm sure Richard will be happy to answer more questions <laughs> informally. Um, so I would like, Richard, that was just the most fascinating and comprehensive presentation. So thank you so much. Thank you.